Um, I'd like to start off by acknowledging that the events being held on the traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Slaywood Tooth, Musqueam and Squamish nations. And I'd also like to thank our sponsors of this year's Green Talk series, um, Alexander College and Hemlock Printers, uh, organisations that are both absolutely committed to sustainability and, and within their businesses and to promoting it far and wide. And we thank them for their support in making uh, this event possible. Uh, we're pleased to be joined today by six uh, tremendous local businesses to discuss sustainability and innovation uh, during a COVID economy. Uh, during today's event, you'll hear six uh, rapid fire presentation segments where speakers will present uh, interesting and engaging five minute talks on all things sustainability, covering everything from green roofs to local food hubs. Um, to kick off today's event, we have Julia Hunter, who is the executive director of Food Stash Foundation. Julia obtained her Bachelor of Science in Nutrition and Dietetics from Acadia University and later completed her, certific her certification as a registered dietitian. With previous experience working in a BC health program for elementary schools and in community, community development for affordable housing, Julia's passion for community health intersects with food security and sustainability. Uh, by working with those who struggle to make ends meet, often putting uh, the food bill on the back burner, Julia is on a mission to make food accessible and affordable without compromising health or the environment. Her approach is both uh, collaborative and creative. Uh, together we can bridge the gap, advocate, and support our community. So Julia, uh, you're up first, over to you. Thanks, Paul. Okay, I'm just gonna share my screen with everyone really quick. All right. Thumbs up if you can see my slide there. Does it look? Okay, perfect. Um, okay, great. So I'm going to talk about Food Stash today. Uh, we were founded in 2016, so we're actually just entering our fourth year of operation. Uh, and as some of you may or may not know, our mission is twofold. So we seek to reduce the environmental impact of food waste and bridge the food insecurity gap, in particular through, through food recovery, which I'll be, um, which will be what I'll be talking about in my presentation. So. Basically, what we do seven days a week is we rescue food that would otherwise go to waste from over 15 suppliers across Vancouver. Uh, and then we deliver that to over 15 partner charities as well as some household food programs that we run as well. So really, we're working to eliminate hunger, of course, um, but also food that would otherwise go to waste. So trying to, to connect this food to people who need it. So on a monthly basis, we rescue over 60,000 pounds of food, but it, it can fluctuate quite a bit. Last month we were up over 70,000 pounds of food um, and we divert it through a couple different streams uh, and our programming, which I'll get into shortly. Next slide. So we have about 20 partner charities and about 75% of that 60,000 pounds goes to those partner charities on the same day um, with our drivers. But about 20% of that food comes back to our storage facilities in Burnaby at YVR Prep, which is a commissary kitchen. Uh, and at YVR Prep, we store the food, we sort it, and then we box it into this image you can see here. So through our rescued food box program, we deliver to about 60 families on a weekly basis. Uh, typically, it's CSA style boxes that you see in the image, but with COVID-19, we've swapped our equipment uh, to bags. So it looks a little different, but same contents. Uh, and that's a weekly program. Uh, and then we also have a very similar program called the Pedal to Plate, which we uh, are proud to have launched this past spring in partnership with Shift Delivery, which is a local electric trike company based in East Vancouver and in uh, support of the Greenest City Vancouver Initiative. So basically this program is identical to the Rescue Food Box program, except instead of volunteer drivers delivering these food boxes to families, uh, it's this trike company, Shift Delivery. So we really strive to be uh, as zero waste as possible and to reduce our own emissions. We realize that with food recovery, obviously we're, we're capturing food that would otherwise go to waste, which is great, but we also have vehicles on the road to facilitate that. So in any part of our programming uh, where we can reduce emissions like this uh, pedal to plate pilot, um, it really just aligns with our values. And so we pursue those opportunities. So right now with this program, we're at about 15 families. Uh, it's starting a bit slow, COVID-19. Uh, it's been interesting try to, trying to get people onto this program, but we're aiming to get up to 50 by March uh, and then reevaluate from there and maybe just continue to expand gradually over time. 
All right, so now we'll be talking um, a bit about our challenges. And so obviously COVID-19 and the impact on our food system has been quite substantial. We've really tried to adapt our programs and create new ones in response to um, the shift in supply and demand from March onward. Uh, so our response has been a little bit of, you know, all over the place as COVID-19 was. So back in March, there was tons of surplus at the restaurant and food business food business level when everyone had to close down. Uh, and so it was quite devastating for these business owners, but what we tried to do is connect that food that was in their fridge and freezers to our partner charities. So at least they had that peace of mind that that food wasn't going to waste. Um, and then we also launched a couple emergency meal response programs in partnership uh, with a couple organizations, notably again, YVR Prep, where we launched a rescued food meal program and so they use their chefs use some of our rescued food into meals to make it affordable which were then directly delivered uh, back into our community and so we are looking to explore that model a little bit more but it was a great opportunity to pilot a rescued food meal program that we had been kind of dreaming of for for a while so um, that was really fun for us and so really within our operations we try to be as closed loop as possible so here you can see the food recovery hierarchy that we try to follow obviously uh, people first, and then it goes down the chain to, to animals, composting, and then of course the last resort being the landfill. So here on our left, you can see uh, one of our previous animal sanctuary partners, Ron, he would come twice a week and pick up our inedible food waste. Um, obviously all the food that we do collect, not all of it is good for humans. So whether it's you know torn or moldy or heavily bruised uh, and better suited for animals, he would come and pick that up. Um, but with COVID-19, we've uh, identified, again, some more opportunities to uh, expand our network. So what we're looking to do in the coming months is diversify our supplier network. Right now, we're really focused on grocery stores. Uh, we're looking to get a little bit more down the food chain to producers, farmers, wholesalers, distributors. That way, if something like this were to happen again, our network is a little bit more broad and our response can be a little bit more strategic. Uh, and then last but not least, connecting back to this photo here, uh, Ron recently moved to the interior. And so we're suddenly without an animal sanctuary partner, uh, which we realized we took a little bit for granted. So right now we're exploring ways that we can still leverage this food that's not good for human consumption, but that could still be used for things like maybe creating soil um, or a product that has value that we could then put back into the community to not only empower individuals, but contribute to a more resilient food system, which in the long run is, is our vision and our goal. Um, so I think that's it. I've really tried to get within that five minute timeline. So I don't know how much time I have left, but um, that was, thanks for listening. That was my five minute presentation. Well, thank you, Julia. And right now in normal circumstances, you'd be hearing a round of applause. So consider yourself virtually applauded. Thank you very much for that. And um, Jocelyn, uh, I, I did hear your phone go off, but that's only because you're in the next office to me. Um, I think you might have been on mute, so um, others wouldn't have, wouldn't have heard, but uh, um, I heard it. So anyway, there you go. Um, Julia, thank you very much. That was really, really interesting and, and some great work there. And good to hear that uh, you're working with, uh, with YVR Prep, who's a, a member of ours at the Board of Trade and is a great organization. They're doing some really, really good work. <clears throat> and and uh, uh, glad, glad to hear you partnered with them. Um, next up, we have a local Burnaby business owner, Leslie Beckman, uh, from Waterhorse Paper Straws. Waterhorse is a family-run startup making small batch paper straws in a warehouse near Burnaby Lake here in Burnaby. With all the attention now on eliminating plastic straws, it's hard to believe that a simple walk, long before anyone banned single-use plastics, started Leslie and Dave on their journey to make paper straws in Canada. And Dave, I remember chatting with you in March just after all this hit, so uh, I'm interested to hear how things are going for you, uh, for you now. Uh, they have always picked up garbage at the high tide line. It's how their parents raised them. But the sheer number of plastic straws on one single day convinced them there had to be a better way. So, Leslie, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Paul. Can, uh, first of all, can everyone hear me? And second of all, can everyone see a very orange screen? Perfect. Um, again, five minutes is really quick. Uh, I'm going to blast through this and if um, there are questions afterwards, um, I'll answer them or we can, you can contact me afterwards. So, uh, Water Horse Paper Straws. Let me put my cursor in the right place. There we go. Um, this is us, saving the world one sip at a time. Um, 
this is the obligatory slide that tells you what I'm going to tell you, who we are. We'll talk a little bit about white paper straws and why us. Uh, a little bit more specifically about what we make, uh, how we make them, because some of the geeks in the audience love that and it's actually really quite fun. Um, and then get to the issue of challenges and opportunities, particularly with respect to COVID. Um, so, uh, water horse. As Paul mentioned, it was one of those typical inception stories. We were walking on a beach, uh, this beach in fact, and that's um, the starter re replacement coral reef in the background. Um, and we still found far too much material that shouldn't be there. Um, who we are, this is us in our natural habitat uh, by day. Uh, Dave is a longtime builder um, and business owner. And me, I'm a, an environmental scientist with a small consulting firm here in Vancouver. Um, we started in December 2018 with essentially nothing uh, except the idea. And uh, since then, we have equipment, uh, warehouse, right in a production line and are up and producing straws and have learned a ton um, that we didn't expect to learn. Um, the question is often why paper straws? Um, and the follow-up question is, aren't straws a uh, drop in the bucket? And I'm not going to go into a lot of information or provide a lot of statistics. The short answer is yes, they represent only about 3% of the weight plastic waste stream that ends up in the marine environment. But it's a really big bucket, as a lot of you will know. Um, we're dealing with 5 million tons of plastic entering the marine environment every year, which is about a BC place full of plastic a day. Um, and straws are the sixth um, most common item found during cleanups. Going without them isn't exactly an option for some people. Uh, some people need them. Some people want them and um, fundamentally they do have a place. It's just that that place is not at sea because plastic, even uh, compostable plastic, doesn't degrade in the marine environment. Uh, they can stick around. Conservative estimate, estimates suggest anywhere between 50 and 200 years. So that's why paper straws. So why water horse? Well, people ask about the name. We like the name and we like the art that an artist prepared for us. But in terms of the business model, why the business model? Um, it has a lower footprint because the uh, inputs come to us in bulk and then are made. Uh, we can trace uh, the, all of the uh, materials that we have. Uh, we can guarantee their quality and we're responsible for the labor practices that go into making them. Um, so we know where everything is coming from. And as we get going, um, we have an intent to give back. We're already working with a number of Indigenous artists to produce um, Indigenous designs. Um, this is from a Cree artist and uh, the next, these are from a Kwakwakua artist. Um, and the other thing we're doing, which was a surprise to us, is we're providing our off our off-size straws to beekeepers who use them in bee, bee rearing, which we did not expect. Um, so unsurprisingly, we make straws. Um, we make them specifically in six, eight, and 10 inch straws that are perfect for cocktails, standard drinks, tall, cold, smoothie type drinks. Uh, the most common colors are white and black. Um, and then we also produce custom colors for specific clients for specific needs. The colors tend not to pop as much as people might expect, but that's because they're food grade inks and food grade inks don't have the chemical compounds in them that are supremely vibrant. Um, we are also now with COVID, uh, every straw is required to be wrapped. We can custom print wrappers for people. So that's happening. And our quantities range packs for whatever people need. Um, in terms of the how we make them, this is the part that's kind of uh, fun for people. Um, paper comes to us. Uh, I would have liked to put a video, but I still don't trust bandwidth in this kind of an event. So uh, you're just getting a, uh, a little bit of a production line image. But if you want to come and see our straws in production, we can definitely do that. And customers are uh, more than welcome to come and hang out with us. Uh, paper arrives to us in a rules of uh, paper. I hear the uh, 
I think I hear Jocelyn's timer, possibly. Um, so carry so on for a little more, Leslie. You've got some interesting stuff here, so carry on for a little bit. Okay, I'm just going to... So basically, we slip the material uh, from this paper into these narrow uh, pieces of paper. We print them up for people. Um, we it, Then it goes through this fantastic, bizarre machine that feeds glues, winds and cuts the paper um, into the straws and then they're wrapped and packaged up for people and you can see the whole train in this picture. Um, there are, have been a number of challenges. We expected that actually the, phys the technical pieces of making the machines work uh, would take the most time and cause us the biggest headaches and in fact the challenges were perception. Um, people were telling us paper straws fall apart, they taste funny, they feel weird. We've worked to combat all of those things um, and we're pretty confident that most people are really happy with what we produce. Um, then there's COVID. Um, COVID-19 has changed everything, unsurprisingly. The hospitality industry essentially shut down and then resized and retooled to focus on takeout. Um, and the single-use uh, plastic waste ban in the city of Vancouver that included uh, both plastic and compostable PLA straws um, has entered into force, but it's not being enforced for obvious reasons. Um, it's really hard on people just to keep going. That said, it's not all um, bad news. There are some uh, positives um, in terms of positioning. There is a real push on domestic uh, purchasing um, to keep uh, the, the economy afloat. Um, we know that we can offer a safe and sustainable alternative to particulate materials that are coming from overseas um, because in, we know where the glues come from in particular. Um, there's a greater awareness that we can't offset uh, safety and protection in terms of COVID uh, with at the expense of the environment. So people are getting back to the idea of paper. Um, and we are working with some other local companies now, Westworld Paper and Green Circle in Ontario, um, to move into paper goods. So we, the take home message is that we're cautiously optimistic. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leslie. That, that was really great. Thank you. And uh, some really interesting information there. And if we haven't connected you already, and another virtual round of applause. Thank you, uh, Maureen. I saw you lead that for us. Um, the, uh, uh, if we haven't connected you already, we have a, another one of your fellow Burnley Water Trade members, BCB uh, Business, which is up on Hastings. You mentioned about the beekeeping sector. So if we haven't connected you already, we have a, a member in our, uh, in our group. Um, so thank you, Leslie. Next we have uh, Dr. Maureen Connolly from the BC BCIT Centre for Architectural Ecology. Uh, combining a science background with a professional affiliation as an architect, Maureen developed the vision, oversaw the construction and the instrumentation of the BCIT Green Roof Research Facility in 2002. Maureen's initial research focused on the architectural and planning impact of green roofs, uh, which led to phase one research on stormwater and thermal performance. Um, Maureen developed the first credited course on green roofs in Canada. Current research focuses on the quantification of the acoustical, God, someone's trying to trip me up with uh, all these words here, but current research focuses on the quantification of the acoustical capacity for green roofs and walls to reduce sound transmission through buildings, reduce noise buildup in urban areas and enhance personal and shared soundscapes. Maureen continues to direct the strategic research and planning process at the BCIT Centre for Architectural Ecology. So Maureen, over to you, and perhaps you can clear up, is the plural of roof, roofs or roofs? Uh, you're on mute, Maureen. And again, is it roofs or roofs? Yeah, I don't know. But... I go with roofs. Better than roofs in Midwestern United States. Roofs. So thank you very much. Uh, welcome everybody. Always a pleasure to speak to uh, one of my favorite topics, which is the center. Um, let's make sure I can advance the slides. To the agenda. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, the development of the Centre for Architectural Ecology. Regional uh, living architecture and, and what we actually found for ourselves. Move into the discussion on quantifying the um, acoustical uh, environment and then our current research. 
So uh, we did come a long way. I mean, we started this in 2002 um, with a number of stakeholders. We had uh, government stakeholders such as uh, Public Works Government Canada, Metro Vancouver, and CMHC. Then we had uh, industry groups, uh, whether it be from actually roofers that were making our roofs, um, Hot Liquid Applied or um, SBS, or TPS, and then people in the green roof industry um, from those that uh, pervade us pervade plants or soils. But in 2002, um, and so on the screen you see our first research center, it was down at Great Northern Way campus, which is now where the Emily Carr University is, and it was just a fantastic place to gather people. Um, and we did, we had groups on policy, groups on research, and groups on developing education. So in 2002 though, 10 years later, we moved back to the Burnaby campus, uh, and that was great. We ended up with the building NE03, which is the old horticultural lab. We um, so it, it, it had all sorts of places for us to grow plants, indoors and outdoors. But we also had the elevated lab where we could do our research. But most important for me is it coincided with the development of the, the master's program in building science. And in the building science program, I was able to advance the topics of acoustics and bring on our graduate students that were doing their work in applied science or their masters in engineering as well. So then we ended up with two labs, um, the living architecture lab and the acoustics research lab. And that allowed us to explain or expand our interdisciplinary work from green roofs and living walls. And um, you can see a graph there where one of the things we were doing is looking at the city and, and the impact of living architecture right down to our old fashioned trees um, and um, uh, grasses on the uh, mixed in with our asphalt. So in that graph, as a for instance, you're looking at sound as it propagates down a regular old laneway and the orange line which is high showing high levels of sound that's coming from something like a bus and going down a lane and then the lower green ones uh, is the same sound going down a lane but it's a, a busted up old lane with lots of trees and old garages um, maybe even some uh, non-ash Baltic surfaces and you can see that the sound level is much lower than that orange line where it's a brand new lane that has um, uh, all sorts of garage doors that are all made out of metal and wood and there's almost no vegetation. And what we're seeing effectively is twice the amount of sound midway through a lane. And now we're putting laneway houses into it. So that's uh, some of the interaction. It's hard to introduce the interaction we had with the city. On the far right, you see an image of uh, one of my grad students. We're now looking at the psychoacoustics um, of green roofs, and I will explain that in, an, in a bit. But I do want to uh, speak to what uh, Paul introduced us um, as doing, is looking at green roof technologies. Oops, I think I missed a slide. Here we go. Um, yes, we did look at thermal performance, and we saw that, you know, sound, um, or sorry, energy, thermal energy, is reduced about 40% um, in, in the winter and about 85% in the summer as it goes through. We looked at um, the amount of storm water, which is mitigated, which is fantastic if you have green roofs, anywhere from 95 to 15%, depending on what season, because we do have a funny season here where it rains all the time. And we looked at the thermal um, expansion of roof membranes um, due to uh, just the diurnal temperature range. And you can see that second uh, slide there, uh, one, two, three over actually. The, the, the blue line is showing a membrane temperature on a regular day and how much it increases, but under the green roof, that blue line is hidden and quite flat in amongst the other colors. So that's just some details. We obviously started to look at photovoltaics and how it integrated and even living walls and the rainwater capacity of living walls. Our current research tends towards uh, the interface between acoustics and living architecture. First, I'll look at um, mitigation strategies and technologies. You all know that we moved into um, new regulations and bylaws with BC Housing for R22 um, building wall assemblies. Well, wait a minute here. That means we have a, an air gap between the envelope and the rest of, of your, your building. And how did that affect how sound transmits through? So we investigate that. Also went into a partnership with the National Research Council on that and have some really interesting data to share on that. We got into a couple technology developments, all of it with green roofs, 
um, sorry, green roof substrates and plants and living wall substrates and plants and looking at how we can mitigate transportation noise or how we can improve anything from a, um, an outside gallery to the inside of a library using absorptive living wall systems. Um, one other project, which is very exciting, has been on Passive House. We all love Passive House for everything it does in terms of thermal, but there was a little quirk in that, that they didn't have a um, criteria in there for acoustics, and they actually made the building so quiet, there's some other impacts. We also are looking at how construction noise impacts other people, not just workers. This is really exciting work here on quantifying the acoustical environment. It used to be we just did DVA, that's World Health Organization, CMHC. We all picked it up and said, hey, you know what? As long as we're not louder than this, we're healthy. But we're moving now to a soundscape approach. We actually have ISO standards that help us investigate loudness, which is our perceptional reaction, sharpness, roughness, tonality. We take surveys where we can understand people's response and their psychoacoustic response. Are they annoyed by sounds or are sounds pleasant? This is so critical as we have to hover down into our neighborhood gardens and, and rooftops uh, for our outdoor pleasures, especially at this time during COVID. We're looking at sounds in the cities with some colleagues, contextual, contextual masking of noise in the city. And at Burnaby um, in the Deer Lake Park, we actually started doing some tranquility rating. Like where can we find tranquility in that park? So that's some just really exciting place. The other interdisciplinary work we're doing in living architecture is, is quantifying how we can use green roofs or living walls at the, uh, to create rooftops where we actually reduce um, the imposition of traffic noise, so it comes up over the edge of the building, and create quiet space on rooftops, as if we're really far out of the city instead of in the middle of the city down at the park. Um, the impact of living architecture in general on our health um, is, is investigated through acoustics. The psychoacoustics um, is really sort of the new dynamic approach to understanding how sound, as, uh, as the World Health Organization says, one of the second largest amounts of pollution that affect our health. And then we're developing the eco city standards for sound quality. So I want to say thank you to that. You can always find me, ask me about some of this work. Um, I, I am blessed to be able to work uh, with my graduate students. Today we're doing a sound walk down at the Olympic Village. Tomorrow we're going on to some rooftops to actually take measurements. We can do it all COVIDly safe. So thank you and um, stay healthy. Thank you, Maureen. That was excellent. Thank you very much. Some uh, really great uh, information going on there. Very, very, very enjoyable. Thank you. Um, okay, next up we have uh, Miguel Santos from Drinkfil. Uh, Miguel handles business development and sustainability innovation at Drinkfil. Um, he defines himself as a sustainability professional with an affinity for designing and building social enterprises whose value proposition, uh, propositions disrupt linear models of consumption and extraction. A graduate of the University of Guelph, uh, Miguel's MA in Geography quickly led him to pursue a career in sustainability uh, consulting. Soon realizing he didn't have to vilify a business, Miguel began using business as a tool for change. That led him to work for a number of small social enterprises while launching his own, uh, the Cordillera Collective, a change agency looking to make holistic sustainability innovation and storytelling uh, accessible for SMEs across North America. Currently, Miguel is working as the Business Development and Sustainability Innovation Manager at Drinkfill in an effort to make zero waste lifestyles accessible and convenient for the everyday person. Miguel, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, let me get started because it's a tiny window. Um, let me just try and share a screen here. There we go. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. I hope so. Okay, so hi, my name is Miguel Santos. I am the Business Development and Sustainability Innovation Manager for Drinkville. Uh, Drinkville um, has two brands, Drinkville and Soapstand. You can think of Drinkville as our refill stations for beverages and Soapstand as our refill stations for soaps and cleaning products, hand sanitizers. 
Um, and I want to go over the crux of our zero waste problem, which is for the more, most popular individual, convenience and accessibility. So I'm sure we can all get around this. Plastic waste is a problem. Um, in fact, 8 million tons of plastic are entering the oceans annually. 86% uh, of Canadian plastic ends up in landfills and only 9% is being recycled. Uh, and lastly, only about, about one third of plastics uh, are being created for single use packaging or products. So this should have and utilize it. Our challenge is how can we make a zero waste lifestyle more convenient, accessible, and logical for, for the everyday person? Uh, people are getting busier, more distracted, and so this is the crux of our business model. What levers do we need to be pulling to make that a reality? So our mission is obviously the, the elimination of single-use plastics from everyday consum consumption habits in a manner that uh, improves quality of life for an individual as well as the environmental health of our spaces around us. The levers we're trying to really target here is innovation, convenience, and sustainability. So regarding innovation, we're tr trying to create a product that makes these consumer choices exciting and novel. Uh, we're also trying to integrate a business model that innovates locally such that we're trying to stock our machines with brands that are local so that we're able to um, redirect commerce locally in a way that en enhances support and community around not just our product, but the people that are in the local realm here trying to improve um, our ability to manage waste. Convenience is, of course, one of the most important things, uh, and that usually re revolves around making zero waste a new habit that is as easy as possible to integrate. We all know new habits only integrate themselves quickly when they're very, very easy. Um, there are other ones that take a lot of time to integrate themselves and become normalized. Um, so we're doing this by placing our stations in high traffic areas or in areas that are transition areas, such as from between home and work. Uh, we're trying to gamify the experience as well to kind of enhance uh, the joy of using something like this. Uh, and we're also trying to eliminate the cost of packaging uh, as, as it's integrated into the final cost of the product. Um, so that's making things easier and cheaper, which is usually hard to argue. Um, of course, sustainability is the final one and you know the true core of our company. Uh, and we're essentially just trying to reduce the amount of single-use plastics that people think they need to use every day. Um, I, think, I think it's really important that we help people understand that enjoying a drink or a cleaning product doesn't always need to come with a disposable vessel of plastic and enjoying those products in your own containers is just as, just as easy, just as convenient, and just as, as, as effective. Um, if you're curious, uh, these are the two products that we're rolling out now. Uh, keep in mind, we are a two-year-old startup, so this, these are very er, er, early stages. Uh, we have the Mini on the left, which uh, is designed specifically for retail spaces or private office spaces, and it contains up to five products, cleaning or, or, or drinks. And our flagship product on the right holds up to about seven products. Uh, currently, we have our pilot launching today in the lobby of Bentel Tower 3, which is where I'm at right now because things need to be done. <laughs> um, so I'm happy to squeeze this in. Um, exactly how it works is really, really easy. You walk up to the machine, you select through the menu of what you might want, you tap your phone or your card to pay, and then you place your bottle under the nozzle and you refill. It's as simple as that. Um, we are doing our very best to um, transfer savings from not paying for the container to the final product so that you're getting a slightly less expensive product, um, but exactly the same. Our desired outcomes are usually around four main things. Uh, the first is to obviously drastically lower the amount of plastic used for regular beverage and soap purchases and consumption. Uh, the second is to provide locally pr produced goods in order to limit distribution-based emissions, uh, while again supporting local economies and building that sense of community. Um, our third is to illustrate the viability of zero waste consumer behavior and purchasing needs, um, such that we will try to drive further expansion and adoption of similar retail offerings by other parties, by other businesses, by other companies. Um, normalizing this entire thought of, hey, how about we just start reusing containers instead of purchasing them with the product? Um, and lastly, make it convenient and rewarding to purchase zero waste goods, much more so than individually packaged ones. And again, this, this transitions from a environmental focus to a more social focus and a behavior change and deconstructing social habits uh, and, and social norms, which is very, very challenging, of course. That's why we're trying our best to make it just so convenient. Our next steps are to build a local Vancouver-based network of soap stand stations in residential areas such as apartment buildings, 
um, and retail spaces. Uh, we're also trying our best to design a soap stand business in a box model that enables motivated entrepreneurs to build their own networks. Uh, we're getting a lot of attention on that side. Uh, and then of course, continuing to integrate our drink fill stations into high traffic areas and private corporate offices to eliminate that very readily available um, mini fridge in an office full of cans that people just could continue to drink throughout the day. Um, I'm glad I squeezed that all in. I know I probably talked a little quick. Um, thank you so much for listening and it's a, a blessing to be uh, around such awesome people. Good job, Miguel. Thanks very much. Uh, some interesting stuff there. Um, I don't suppose you have beer as one of those refillable products, do you? We're working on it. We're working on it. <laughs> We've got some good breweries here in Burnaby. We'll put you in touch. Um, so thanks, Miguel. Next, we have a special live on location presentation from Wes Hooper of Life Space Gardens. Uh, Life Space Gardens started building uh, gardens because they saw a need for a system that would allow, would allow people to succeed at growing truly organic pr produce while fitting into their busy lifestyles. Uh, Life Space wanted to ensure our communities would have gardening success while overcoming the constant uh, demands of, of constant watering. So they created the most efficient sub-irrigation system possible. Additionally, they know um, in our changing climate how important it is to value and conserve water. So they developed a system that wastes as little uh, of water as possible. Please welcome our next speaker, uh, Wes Hooper. So Wes, on location, over to you. On mute. There you go. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hey. Um, so thanks for joining me here at uh, Lower Lonsdale in North Vancouver. I thought we would kind of break the sort of traditional uh, PowerPoint slide and take you guys on site to one of our, our favorite installations that we've done to date. Um, uh, just to recap a little bit about we're, what we're about is um, we're a team of, of, traditionally we were carpenters. We started off doing carpentry, uh, building decks, fences, pergolas, uh, stuff like that. And about 10 years ago, we really got into building raised garden beds. We had a number of clients that were really, really excited about uh, growing their own veggies. So we started building raised, raised beds. And, um, and what we realized very quickly is that watering was a big problem. Um, there are some systems out there that work somewhat okay, but uh, but there's still challenges. In fact, we found that you know about 90% of the people we spoke with, um, they either they either had already tried gardening and and failed, or they were too intimidated to start growing their own food because of the demands of watering. You know, a lot of people out there, you know, they thought, hey, I've tried this, I've grown my tomatoes, it didn't work out. I, I went away on the weekend and they died. I've got a black thumb. It's like, no, you do not have a black thumb. You just forgot to water. And so that led us to, uh, to start doing some research, uh, start looking around to see what, what else was on the scene. And what we actually ended up going back to is a very ancient technique. Uh, sub irrigation is, is not new. Um, you know, the, uh, the Incas were using it, the Egyptians were using it. it was, uh, it's, a, it's an ancient technique that was just somewhat forgotten for like the last 2000 years, which is crazy. So what we did is we took those ideas and we just created a system that allows us to adopt it for a sort of like a modern application. And what we've done here in, uh, in Lower Lonsdale is we've used our garden well sub irrigation system to create a network of more than 30 gardens growing in the public space. And the reason we're able to do this and do this successfully is because of this garden well sub irrigation system. Instead of watering every single day, which is normally what you have to do when growing veggies in a planter, these gardens that you see behind me here, this garden got watered 10 times this year. And how we do that is we have our little fill-up pipe. So we've got a little floating hummingbird down here. So this guy floats up and down and tells us if there's water in the reservoir. And all you do is you take the cap off here, fill up this tube, and that takes the water right down to the reservoir, pop that back down. And as long as there's water within your garden, it wicks up from the bottom of the planter up into the soil through capillary action. And that is super efficient. You know, there's, there's no evaporation. There's very little runoff. You can direct the runoff wherever you want. You can recycle the runoff. It's excellent when it rains, that reservoir fills up first. And so it's just this, this optimal growing environment because opposed to other watering techniques, which kind of emulate rain, you know, from the top down, you know, a lot of that drip irrigation standard sprinklers in the summertime heat, like, you know, kind of feels like summer out here still today. You know, a lot of that water will just evaporate off before it even gets down to the roots. And with our system, that water is always coming from the bottom up. 
you know, so it's, it just makes that growing environment much more consistent. The plants always have access to like an even moisture level, which just allows things to thrive. And, you know, look at this here, you know, we've got beautiful eggplants growing in here. You know, we've got some, some string beans growing up in here. You know, you guys want some beans? You know, if this was live, you guys could be snacking right now. And so what makes it so special is it just really simplifies the process. And that's what, al that's what allows us to do these really innovative product or projects where we can, you know, this is growing street side, you know, Lonsdale's right there. This is first street. This is a really busy, busy area. And we can maintain this success by just doing once a week maintenance, which is kind of unheard of when you're growing your own, when you're growing veggies. And to, to, top, to, to finish it off here, I just want to talk a little about the, the sort of approach because when we started this, it, was, it took three years to integrate this, this program where we convinced the city to allow us to grow these veggie gardens because there was all this pushback about you know, vandalism and people abusing the gardens and stealing the produce. Well, what we've done here is we've created this for everybody, right? So um, you can walk down the street, you can grab a string beans, like these gardens are for the community. And it's been, the, the, the way it's taken off down here is just amazing. You know, people, there's little communities that have sprung up around all these gardens, like neighbors and businesses are, are taking care of them. And it's just been like a great, great experience. So <clears throat> that is what our goal is, is we want to take um, our services, our technology, and we want to, you know, convince municipalities, convince architects, convince designers to start really integrating food production into urban design, into architectural buildings, into every, every new development, you know. And you, you can do that through, through um, convenience. You've got to make it easy, um, efficient. You know, you have to be very um, conservative with, uh, with, with water. Like, for example, this saves about 80% of the water compared to traditional watering techniques. And also it has to be attractive. And I think that's one thing where a lot of these urban food movements are, are kind of missing out is aesthetics and design um, are important, right? People like beautiful things. And if things are beautiful, they wanna spend more time around them. So we go that extra mile to, to make things well, to build them well, to build them with, uh, with the design eye in mind and, and then highly functional. So, you know, that's, uh, that's pretty much us in a wrap. You know, we build these beautiful gardens for municipalities, for um, uh, new developments, for local businesses, like on your patio, front deck, uh, but also for homeowners. So your, your front yard, backyard, rooftop, um, and we, they, all come, they all come in any shape, any size. And that is the beauty of our sub irrigation system is it is entirely modular, comes in one square foot tiles that click together to form a grid, um, any shape or size. So you can apply it to any garden you want. So it's, it's really just the easiest way to grow your own food and um <clears throat> yeah we love it we love working here we love building them and uh the communities and our clients really uh really appreciate it as well too so just making it easier for for local food production food is the future and uh, that's what we're growing thanks a lot Wes. that was excellent and, and great to see your passion and enthusiasm for it as well <laughs> it's uh Great to see. So well done. That was that was very very interesting. And uh, uh, let us know if if, if you want to have uh, uh, some chats with the right folks in the city of Burnaby. Let us know, and we'll see what we can do to help. Love it. Um, it's interesting stuff. Uh, so thanks a lot, uh, Webways. That, that was great. Uh, so now we're coming up on our sixth and final presentation for today's webinar. Uh, I'd like to welcome Mike Donaldson, who's the VP Fusion Island Engineering from General Fusion. Uh, Mike is a systems engineer with 18 years experience in the development of novel and disruptive te technologies. He has broad experience in product development, production engineering and engineering management. Uh, he's led multidisciplinary teams in high risk and complicated technical projects with a focus on risk reduction through rapid prototyping and physical testing. Prior to joining General Fusion in 2009, Mike had been with Kodak, uh, or Creo, since 1999 contributing in production engineering and product development roles. He has a BSc in uh, Engineering Physics from Queen's University and a Master's in Science from Engineering Physics from uh, UBC. So Mike, um, over to you. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Fusion in Five Minutes. So we'll get going here. Um, it's not a surprise. Everyone here knows that the global demand for energy is rising. Electricity demand is projected to double worldwide by 2050. Um, but while we, it, it's also true that the world at the same time is trying to address climate change. Uh, BC has committed to 
reducing greenhouse gas, emiss gas emissions by 40% below 2007 levels in 2030. Uh, the Canadian government, of course, has agreed to um, uh, the Paris Accords um, to a, at least 30% by 2030. Uh, and in 2019, locally, the city of Burnaby committed to reducing carbon emissions by 45% by 2030 and to become carbon neutral buyer before 2050. Um, so while that's uh, uh, noble, the solution, we do, re we do know that the solution is going to require more than renewable resources. You can't always control where and when the sun will shine and the wind will blow. It's pretty accepted that, um, uh, it's pretty accepted that when it comes to the base load, renewables aren't going to be the total solution. And uh, fusion energy uh, seems to be uh, a great uh, a place to fill in the rest of that base load goal. So quick little bit of science here, for those of you that don't know what fusion is, fusion happens on, is the process that happens on the sun. And we can do fusion here on earth. Uh, the easiest fusion reaction to get going is a reaction between two isotopes of hydrogen. Deuterium, which is hydrogen with one extra neutron or one neutron, and tritium, which is hydrogen with uh, two neutrons. Deuterium is naturally occurring. One in every 6,000 hydrogen atoms in the world is a deuterium atom. Tritium is not naturally occurring, but you can produce it. So in order to get fusion, what you do is you have to ram these two particles uh, uh, against each other um, at high speeds. If you get them going fast enough, they will fuse. And then they create uh, two byproducts, which is helium and a neutron and a whole bunch of energy. This is not General Fusion's idea. Fusion is, is, has been known for a long time and there are lots of people working on it. Uh, and it seems fairly straightforward. The problem is that uh, in order to get that reaction to happen, you have to heat it up to 150 million degrees centigrade. And that's the trick when it comes to fusion is how can you get that thing hot enough and last long enough in order to be able to uh, uh, make enough energy. And that's where general fusion comes in. Uh, general fusion is uh, the world's most uh, advanced private fusion company. Now fusion usually happens at the, in, in national labs and in academia and at the university level, but we found um, uh, there's an appetite for private companies like general fusion to try and tackle this problem. So. We're based in Burnaby. We've been here, uh, well, we founded in about 2002 and we've been here in our present form since about 2009. We were founded by my colleague, Dr. Michelle Leberge. And we've grown, um, we're approximately 80 employees right now uh, based in Burnaby. And our goal is to produce um, power plants with, uh, uh, that can produce viable fusion energy. Now, Leslie, I'm gonna try the video here. Uh, I, I went with the idea of a video. This is our, um, this is our scheme for producing fusion. Basically what we do is we inject a hot ionized gas of deuterium and tritium, not quite 150 million degrees centigrade, but fairly hot. And we inject it into a cavity of liquid metal. Uh, we then use steam driven pistons to compress that uh, uh, hot gas to fusion conditions. We'll get a burst of fusion energy. Um, the energy is released and absorbed, uh, heats up the liquid metal. And then we can circulate that liquid metal through a heat exchanger to produce steam, which then traditionally we can use to produce electricity in generators. Um, again, fusion isn't general fusion's idea, uh, but this method of it um, lends itself to being uh, uh, an economical solution. Um, the reason why fusion is uh, uh, so attractive is basically we get our, our fuel from water. Um, uh, if you think about the energy that's in 55,000 barrels of oil, um, that can really be replaced with the deuterium that you'd find in about one liter extra extracted from one liter of water. So if you think about it, literally a liter of water could be powering ten thousands of homes uh, for a year. It's safe. Um, uh, it is a uh, hard reaction to get going, so it's inherently uh, fail safe. Um, it, you can put it anywhere. It's not dependent on where your fuel is. It's not uh, uh, dependent on where the sun shines and the wind blows. Um, it's, and, and there are no greenhouse gases. It's the ultimate clean energy source, but it's very hard to get going. So that's what General Fusion is trying to do. We're, we're one of a bunch of people that are working on this, uh, uh, working on this problem. And we're hitting a next um, uh, very exciting uh, step in our company's development. Um, we are growing. Uh, we've demonstrated the components that are required for our fusion power plant. 
And now we want to put them all together into a demonstration plan. So um, that's what our company's working on now. Um, uh, this project is kicked off in earnest. We've been working on it for a few years, but really kicked off in earnest uh, over the last couple of months. And uh, we're very excited to uh, tackle this uh, uh, global problem and do it right here in Burnaby. So 45 seconds over five minutes, but uh, I hope, uh, hope it was good enough. That was great, Mike. Thank you very much. And uh, great to see such uh, phenomenal work going on uh, right in our backyard here in, in Burnaby. And I know that uh, you've been recognized a couple of times through our Excellence Awards program so, uh, for some of the work you've been doing. So congrats on that and, and congratulations on the great work that, uh, that you're doing right here. <clears throat> so, so thank you very much to all the, the presenters um, here. Uh, I think we've all learned a great deal from um, our presenters today. Some, some really great innovative uh, ideas and programs going on. Um, and and it's, uh, it, it really does stimulate the thinking, doesn't it? That, that you learn a lot of this, these things here and you kind of walk away thinking, well, what can we do in our organization to, to make our own contributions? And, and, and is there anything that we've seen from these other folks here that's applicable to us? So, so have a look at that yourselves and to all of our, our uh, attendees today and, and, and think about what perhaps you can be doing um, and, uh, and, and how we can all work together. And that's a big part of us as, as the Burnaby Board of Trade, the Chamber of Commerce for the City of Burnaby here is, is bringing people together with events such as this and just introductions of, of, of people who can collaborate and work together uh, for the common good for, for each other and for all of us uh, uh, collectively. So um, thanks again to everybody. Uh, this is an area of sustainability. We've, <clears throat> we've kind of led the way in the Chamber of Commerce world in terms of having events such as this and programs that we've developed. Um, and, it, and it's really great to, uh, to, to, to have the group that we had here today. Um, please check out some other upcoming events for opportunities to, uh, to, to mix and, and uh, be engaged in the business community. Uh, we have a BCOR 101 session um, on Tuesday the 6th of, of October at 9 o'clock, um, which is uh, looking at the global movement of entrepreneurs who use a new business tool and certification designed to measure their success and impact. <coughs> Excuse me, on Wednesday the 7th, um, uh, the CRA will be discussing COVID tax measures, wage subsidy and much more. So uh, everyone's been interested in, in that over this last little while. So feel free to join that on the 7th. On the 14th, if uh, you or any of your colleagues are interested in what we do as an organization above and beyond what you've seen today, and you're interested in perhaps being a part of, of the Burnley Board of Trade, I know many of you already are, um, then uh, either reach out to us or join us at our information session on the 14th of October. And then Small Business Week starts towards the end of, of October and we're going to have a full week of programming there um, uh, and social media cont uh, contests to help the small business community. So thanks again. Lovely to see everybody. Uh, if, as I say, if, you, if you'd like to, to, uh, to learn more about us, please reach out to me at paul at bbot.ca or any of my colleagues. Um, enjoy the rest of the day. As we saw from West just now, it's a beautiful sunny day out there. So uh, enjoy the rest of the day and uh, we, we hope to see you soon. Thank you very much.